Здравствуйте еще раз. Теперь уже в микрофон. Большое спасибо, что сегодня пришли. Нас сегодня немного, но лекция обещает быть интересной, и я очень ожидаю хорошей продуктивной дискуссии. Я буквально в течение минуты представлю наш проект. Меня зовут Анна Гольцова, я представляю голландский образовательный центр Nufik Nasa Russia. Мы официальные представители всего высшего образования Голландии в России. И начиная с 2015 года мы начали такой проект, он называется Dutch Science Talks. Мы приглашаем преподавателей, профессоров, исследователей из Нидерландов, чтобы они рассказали о своем, о своем исследовании, о своих исследованиях. Лекции проходят на английском языке, и потом, по возможности, мы их выкладываем в интернет. Вот сегодняшняя лекция будет доступна на YouTube, и в течение месяца, я надеюсь, что мы сможем подготовить и русские субтитры. Вот. Сегодня у нас в гостях Энтони Крёнер, исследователь, историк из Нидерландов. Он расскажет о бароне Врангеле и адвокате Маклакове. Буду рада вашим вопросам, вот всех, кто к нам сегодня пришел. Энтони. Um, I will I will first speak uh, about half an hour about uh, Wrangel, and then uh, perhaps 10-15 minutes for discussion, uh, then about half an hour on uh, Maklakov, uh, and then 10-15 minutes um, discussion on, uh, on Maklakov. Um, well, <coughs> you you all know uh, Wrangel, uh, who was. Uh, How did, how did I come to, to write about uh, Wrangel? I was, I was looking into the civil war of Russia and I couldn't find a comprehensive and <clears throat> objective biography of Wrangel. Uh, I searched all the libraries and there was no one. Just only one of his son, Alexei, whom I met in Ireland several times, but he, he um, worshipped his father. He, he, he was only six years old when his father died. And he wrote the book, The White Crusader, uh, Wrangel. Um, and that was only without any uh, critics, um, without any criticism. So that's, um, then I thought it, it's worthwhile to, to write a biography, which I did. And I did a lot of research in uh, Moscow, in Garf. Um, also a lot of the history in the Historische um, Publice. Bibliotheque here yeah. yeah, in Moscow, um, and also in the um, in the historical um, war archive, Bayeni Istorichki Archiv, and there I found everything about his uh, regiment, which was the Lebardi Konipolk. Um, where he was uh, enlisted as a uh, when he uh, had to fulfill his compulsory military service. He was born in uh, 1878 um, in near Rostov in the south of Russia, where his father uh, Nikolai Yegorovich had um, substantial business interests, and he wanted his son to be a mining engineer to help him, well, to, 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 to work in one of his companies. So when he was, um, he, he went to the um, gymnasium in uh, Rostov, and then when he was uh, 12 years old, they moved to um, Petersburg to, um, to enlist him in, um, uh, no, when he was, sorry, when he was 18 years old, to enlist him in the uh, Gorny Institute, Well, the, the Mining Institute, the Technical University, which was established by um, Catherine the Great in 1785, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it's in the book, but I forgot it. Um, and there he, um, he was trained for five years as a mining engineer, Gorni Ingenieur, um, and then he had to uh, fulfill his uh, military obligations. Um, Every man who had followed um, university uh, education had only to serve two years in, um, in the military, and he enlisted in the Leopardi Konipulk. Uh, 
which was sort of family regiment, where his uncle, um, he, he had a cousin there, his uncle had been officer, his great great uncle had been officer who had uh, been fighting in the Library of Connipol during the Napoleonic Wars. So, and he, uh, he liked uh, life in the, in the, in the horse guards very much. But then he, uh, when he completed his stint as two years as, uh, as, uh, as an officer, he left it as a reserve officer and went to Siberia to, um, to work as a mining engineer. But then the Russo-Japanese War broke out in 1904 and he um, directly enlisted again in the war because, as he later wrote, he really liked to fight. Um, he, he hunted also, he liked to fight and to hunt. That's meaning uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to understand nowadays, especially if we talk about that in Holland, that people really like to fight and to hunt because they're all trying to be peaceful. Um, but Varga liked it. And so he, he served uh, two years in, um, in um, Manchuria and in China in the Russo-Japanese War. And after that, he was um, he stayed on the military service. Um, so then he um, became part of the Dragoon Regiment, Horse Guards also. Um, and then one day, Nicholas II saw him in a parade, and he asked Khan um, uh, Hichewan, he, who was the commander of the Horse Guards, who is that tall man on, on, on that horse? He said, well, that's uh, Baron Wrangel. He said, I want him, I want him in the uh, horse guards. So he became an officer in the horse guards, um, where he, well, stayed on till 1914, when he was um, Stabsratmeister, which is uh, something like a captain. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I can show already some of the... Uh, so this is the Gerb Dvarian i Barone Wrangel. So it's the coat of arms of Russian Wrangels with Rumpo non plecto, which means is I'm bending, but I'm not breaking. Somebody speaks Latin better? Um, yeah, that's good translation. Something like that. <laughs> Well, this is and this is uh, what is what is left of their house in the in Rostov uh, Nadano. I saw I, I myself took the picture, um, so it's it's a ruins, but it, it used to be a very nice house. We see it, Nikolai Yegorovich's house in the Gazette. Um, and this is um, the house they bought in uh, Saint Petersburg um, on the Bassinia. Yeah? number um, 27 and I think well I think here is the flash I think this is the house I'm not quite sure but because all the numbers have changed now so I can't I can't say it uh, exactly but but it, I think it is I think that is the one um, this is the Nevsky Prospect in Petersburg well, which is all very known to you this is the mining institute Gorny Institute in Petersburg um, this is the map of the Far East during the Russo-Japanese War, and we can see here, yet, um, where's the flash? Uh, Mukden here, Mukden is where the famous battle took place, um, where the Japanese, um, I think, won, won, won the day, but uh, the Russians said nobody won, just like the, the battle of um, Borodino where the French claimed that they won and the Russians said uh, that they won. But uh, according to me, it's, it's, well, it's, it was not a very good um, outcome for the Russians. Um, this is the uh, Manesh of the Horse Guard Regiment in Petersburg. That's a photo um, at that time, uh, where they practiced every day. So the officers were allowed to, to spend the night as they wanted. They might go to bed or not go to bed, but at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, they had to be present. Uh, they had to be present in the manege to, to, well, to practice horse riding. Um, this is um, 
these are the members of the Wrangel family as, 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 uh, in, in Holzgaard. Um, his father is not here because his father served only one and a half year. And then he left the service because for several reasons which are not, uh, not so very important. But this is an uncle. This is a cousin. Um, this are, this are all cousins, but from another branch of the family, but all Wrangels. Uh, from Hubenthal, um, and this is uh, this is Wrangel himself. Uh, this is um, um, Karl Grigorovich, uh, who fought in the Napoleonic uh, Wars. This is the um, a photo of the uh, of the officers of the Horse Guards uh, during summer maneuvers, where they were, and uh, that was near. Um, Нет, Саркс и Силу? Да, по-моему, да. It's, it's a long time, I didn't read my own book. So, <laughs> these, are all, these are all the officers. So, well, it's a bit... But you see there are a lot of... Um, the commander is... Khan um, Gichewanski. Um, he was the regimental commander and he is... Um, well... He, he was, according to me, not a very uh, competent uh, commander, uh, which we will see in 1914. This is the Caucasian Front in 1415, and at the officers of the Savage Division, which just a photo included because it's interesting. He is Mikhail uh, Lvovich, who is the son of uh, Lev Nikolaevich. This is... Um, um, this is Keller, this is, no, this is Keller, this is Tolstoy, this is Abalensky, and this is the Sidney Riley, which is we who wrote a famous book about the nine days uh, of revolution in Petersburg, and he was, no, it's not him, he was a spy for the English, and he was an adventurer. Um, this is uh, Wrangel on, on horseback. Uh, at, at about at 1914, when uh, when they went to to war, oh, this is um, I've got to skip that because that's in the Civil War. Um, well, there we are in the, in the First War. He was one of the first officers to get a uh, St George Medal in 1914, in August 1914, at the Battle of Kaufschen, um where they captured a German gun. And he, for that action, he, he, he got his uh, uh, St. George Medal, which is a um, very high distinction. And, and it was the only medal he always wore. He had it, he, you wear it around your neck here, which is, it, it's a white cross. And that's, that's one of the most distinguished orders in the Russian army at that time. And he never wore all the other ones. He just, just wore that one. Um, well, at the end of the war, um, in 1917, he was Lieutenant General. He commanded a division in the, near the border of Romania. And then, um, in, in, well, in February 1917, of course, Nicholas II uh, um, resigned. Uh, we had a provisional government, which a lot of officers had sworn uh, allegiance to the Tsar, and they don't want to to serve under a uh, provisional government. But most of them still went on. The situation became very difficult. But um, and then at the end, well, in October in 1917, there was the well, the coup d'état, which I don't consider as a real revolution because it was a, a, a shift of power, really. Uh, and then uh, Wrangel resigned because most of the Tsarist officers couldn't serve any longer. There were still a lot of Tsarist officers and generals who served um, in, in, the, in, the, in the Red Army. But in January, in December 17, January 18, the Volunteer Army was formed in the south of Russia. And, but he then lived with his family in a villa of, uh, of the family in the well, in, 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 in the Crimea. And he joined um, the uh, volunteer army only in August 1918. 
and then he directly got a command of a division. Um, he fought, well, he fought very bravely, but um, very soon he got into conflict with um, the Niking. Um, ah, well, I'll show you here a map of the um, the different um, positions of, of, of the Red Army and the White Army, but in um, that was winter 18 um, and 19. In October 19, the White Armies came to um, Baronish and West Kursk, well, a little bit further, and they were about 150 kilometers, no, 200 kilometers from Moscow. Um, Wrangel had always insisted on joining the army of Kolchak, but that was already after the taking of uh, Tsaritsyn in June, uh, in June 19. Here is Tsaritsyn, well, later on Stalingrad, Volgograd. Um, they had already captured Yekaterinodar. Where are we? That's Yekaterinodar. And Wrangel proposed to draw the line here from Tsaritsyn to Yekaterinodar because they were they were defended by the Dnieper here and the Volga here. It's not it's not very clear, but here's the Volga. Um, but uh, the Niking said, no, all armies will go straight forward to Moscow, Namazvu. And that's a famous directive. And yeah. Um, and then the three different armies didn't join, but they went straight on to Moscow. Then in the rear, um, there was operated Machno, who was a, um, an, an anarchist, an Ukrainian anarchist, who really disrupted everything. And he had about 10,000 men at his disposal at the time. Um, and that was why Wrangel had proposed to, to draw the line Yekaterina Dar Tsaritsyn to finish with Machno and to build up the reserves. And it's a, it's a pity uh, Denikin didn't listen to, uh, to Wrangel because I think that that's, that's one of the causes why they lost. But eventually, there's a lot of discussion, uh, eventually the, the White would have lost anyway because the population at large was in favor of the Red Army and the Communists. Um, and the majority of the people didn't want a restoration of the monarchy. And that's, um, and, and, and you, you, can't, you can't return history, but that's one, that's one of the causes of the, uh, I think the propaganda, the propaganda of the whites was insufficient. And the propaganda of the of the Red Army and the, and, and the communist regime was much better, and they promised all land to the peasants, which they didn't do, of course, but the peasants believed them. Um, Wrangel, uh, nevertheless, when he occupied, uh, when he went to the Crimea in March 1920 to succeed Denikin. And he um, initiated land reform here, here agrarian, agrarian reform. Uh, and he gave back, he split up the big estates and gave part of it back to the peasants. Um, but that was a little bit too late to, to, because there was a lot of resistance of a lot of people and he, he, he had to fight as well. So he couldn't really control this reform. But I think that if he had succeeded the Niking, in 1919, much earlier, or 1918, then the outcome of the Civil War would have been, could have, could have been quite different. But that's always if history. Um, so there we are in 1920. Um, um, Wrangel, when, when the White Army was thrown back to Novorossiysk, uh, there were annihilated by the Red Army, but part of it escaped to the Crimea. And he occupied the Crimea, he rebuilt the army, and then the Reds, the Red uh, Army, neglected to annihilate the White Army right in the beginning. They should have done so.
but they thought, well, there's only only a few few thousand men. We can deal with them much later on. Um, but then he he held out till November 1920, till eventually the Red Army, Poland, uh, negotiated a peace with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Republic, and that meant that the Soviet Army could. Um, distract a lot of troops straight to the Crimea, to southern uh, Russia, and they, he was annihilated in uh, 7 November up till 7 November 1920, when he evacuated 140,000 people in um, in in I don't know how many boats, and they went to Constantinople here, uh, where all the refugees were eventually resettled in a lot of countries. The army was resettled in Yugoslavia or in the Kingdom of Serbia, Croatia and Slovenia at the time, uh, in Bulgaria, and part of part of the troops were dispersed in other countries, but as small units. Vrabel himself settled in Sremski Karlovci in Yugoslavia and Serbia, and from there on he stayed till 1926 and then in 1926 he moved to Brussels, where eventually he died in April, um, 25 April 1928. And um, his his family, well, uh, his youngest son Alexei, and his youngest daughter uh, Natasha, whom I spoke in New York, she died in 2013 when she was 100 years old. And I visited her in 2006, uh, and then she was already 93 years old. But she was, um, she had a little bit trouble in reading. She read part of my manuscript, uh, and then um, she commented on it. But she was bright as everything, and she really, um, she had a. Uh, the, the, the attitude of a real lady, Pavidinia, Pavidinia, Yanyazna, Pavidinia Dam. And then when I finished the book, she, um, she lived the last three years with her son, Piotr Basilevsky, in, um, in New York. Um, and when the book came out, for the last three weeks, every night, uh, her son, Piotr Basilevsky, had to read from my book to Natasha about about her father, um, and, and 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 I think I, I think that that's the best uh, the best critic I ever could get because if I've written uh, I've I've had several rather good critics in literary um, in, in historical journals, but for me that was the most important critic that her, that his daughter wanted to read, be read every night, um, my book. Um, so uh, Wrangel died. He he died rather suddenly in in five weeks' time, and the family, his daughter Natasha and his son Alexei, maintained up till the very last moment when I spoke to him that he was poisoned by the GPU. But he he died of um, tuberculosis, and. At the time, you had a, a you, you had a, a, a very uh, dangerous form of tuberculosis, and they caught it. Oh, yeah, still working. They called it uh, galloping consumption. That means if you had this type of bacille, bacille, of course, you could die within a few weeks, which you act actually did, um, because all the laboratory reports which I've seen and I've 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 consulted. Uh, a long specialist in uh, in Holland, and he said, "Well, if you have that sort of bacille, you're finished." Because there was no at that time antibiotics. Because perhaps you remember that uh, Fleming, the Scottish uh, scientist, he discovered only uh, in August 1929 uh, penicillin, which was the first antibiotic, and that was and that that was far too late to save uh, Wrangel because nowadays. Nobody is dying of uh, of uh, tuberculosis anymore. Well, perhaps some, but it's it's it's, it's rather rare. Um, so there you are. Um, the family still believed he was poisoned, um, and and but but I spoke several historians here in Russia 
who said, well, that's impossible. You, because you can't uh, infect somebody with Koch bacilli. Then you've got to, to, to keep under his nose every day during half an hour a small test tube with Koch bacilli and you've got to inhale them. Well, who's going to do that? So it's, 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 not, it's not a person you can add to food when somebody is dying. That, that's absolutely impossible. But in 1930, Kutyepov, the Russian general, was abducted by, by the GPU. And in 1937, Miller, also commander of the White Army, was also abducted. And he was brought to the Lubyanka here and they were killed. So after that, everybody thought, you, well, well, you see, Wrangel, Wrangel really was uh, poisoned by them. But, um, but that, that's, that's not true. Okay, well, uh, I'll show you some more, uh, some more slides. Um, I, I, I took. The, I, I also put in the book this picture of. Um, these are um, <coughs> uh, prisoners of war, the Red Army. Why did I put that? Because they were very bad clothed. A lot of these prisoners of war enlisted in the White Army. Why? Because Not because they believed in the White Cause, but they got good clothing, they got good shoes, and they got, and they got fat every day. So that's, uh, well, that was a way to survive. Otherwise, they would have been, uh, they would have been uh, uh, dying in a, in, in, in a prisoner camp. Um, so that's, for me, it was, um, you see, they didn't fight out of conviction, but just um, the need to survive. Uh, we've seen that. Um, this is, well, you see where the White Army came. This is October 19, just, just near Tula, which is, um, well, you can see here the scale. It's about, well, not even 200 kilometers to Moscow. And then the Red Army got really frightened, because that, that would have meant that if Tula was all the, the big arms factories was captured, that would have been a big victory for the White Army. But then they were thrown back all the way, and you see no other seas there, there, they were pushed in the sea, really. Um, this is a poster I, I found myself, uh, I, 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 I found it in Dom Knigi here in, uh, in Moscow, and that's Put uh, Um and he is, uh, he, is, he is constructing a road. Um, out of, uh, well, out of um, uh, skills. How, how do you say that? I forgot the word. In Russian? Yeah, in Russian. Russian. Chiripa. Chiripa. Ah, yes. <laughs> Skull, skills, I know the, the, the English of Chiripa. And this is, a, this is a banker, this is a general, and there's a priest. And they were all put here as a support for Vrangel. Um, well, that, that's gives you some idea. This is uh, Wrangel with uh, Kribochein, who used to be um, um, well, head of the Department of Agriculture before the, before the revolution. This is Shatilov, his chief of staff, Pavel Nikolaevich Shatilov, and one of his best friends. Um, this is the Bolshoi Dvariets in Sevastopol, which you can't fight anymore because it was bombed uh, in the Second World War. And here you see uh, I think Wrangel is, is, is here somewhere, or oh, it's him, I, I don't know exactly, but he's, he's, there's a parade going on. Um, I'll finish, this is a part of his, his, his staff. This is uh, money issued by, it's a banknote of 500 rubles, um, as the secretary of Bernatsky, the financial department here, and this is Nacelny Kredit Nocesti, um, uh, Sufcinski. This is Wrangel with his wife um, and the three children. Piotr is, 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 this is Jelena, the eldest daughter. This is Piotr and this is Natasha. Um, Alexei was not born yet. Well, this is a picture. This is a picture of Lukul. This was the yacht where he lived in Constantinople, which was sunk by an Italian freighter um, and, and he escaped uh, narrowly. 
this is uh, vulnerable in civil civil clothing, which is uh, exceptional because normally you always see them in uniform. This is uh, before parade in Gallipoli, where um, a lot of a lot of the uh, the White Army was relocated. And Gallipoli is just very near Constantinople. This is an orphanage um, in Constantinople. This is um, Wrangel speaking at the uh, at the Sabranje. This is and this is very interesting. This is his mother, <coughs> Maria Mitrovna. In the library of the Anitskov Palace, renamed People's Museum in Petrograd in 19. And nobody knew she was the mother of the Black Baron. Otherwise she wouldn't be safe. But she couldn't escape. She escaped later on, later in the year. <coughs> I think it is summer 19. She could escape to Finland. But um, that, this is very funny, of course, because on all the tram, uh, uh, streetcars of the tram, was written death to Wrangel. And she was sitting in that uh, in that tram. Uh, this is Seremsky Karlovsky. This is also Seremsky Karlovsky. Uh, also, this is in a in a railway wagon in a, in Yugoslavia. These are Russian officers who worked in 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 a mine in Bulgaria. Here in mining clothes and here in their uniforms, just the same the same the same guys. This is um, This is with his youngest son Alexei, who, had, who who adopted the same attitude as his father, with his hands at his uh, at his back. Very funny. This is the house in Brussels where they lived. Uh, there is a plaque commemorating uh, Wrangel lived there. This is um, is um, at the start that he. Uh, well, that he lived there, and if you look at his height, it's one meter and eighty centimeters, which is a rather normal normal height. But at the time, he was very tall, considered. But the average man at the time was one meter and sixty centimeters, and he was one meter and eighty centimeters. Nowadays, he, you wouldn't remark him on the street, but at the time, you 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 could see he was a very long man. So this is the family, uh, Piotr, uh, Yelena, Natasha and Alexei. Uh, this is his uh, funeral, um, this is in Brussels, and this is the funeral in, um, in Beograd, in uh, Serbia. This is after the funeral, um, this is Katerinevsky, his secretary, this is his wife, and this is Palialog, uh, a representative of Wrangel. And this is an interesting photo because this is where the whole family is united in 1915. Um, uh, this is 1950 and uh, 1950. Uh, um, here you see um, where's Alexei? Mm -mm -mm. This is Alexei. This is Piotr. Um, this is Yelena, this is Natasha. This is uh, the brother of uh, Olga Mikhailovna, who was an officer in the, in the cavalry regiment. This is uh, Pyotr Basilevsky. Um, this is the wife of, uh, of uh, Pyotr. Um, well, that, that's it. Okay. Well, if you have any questions, uh, I'm ready uh, to ask. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot. Uh, who has any questions? Well, I do have one. Uh, and you started answering it uh, just before in your small talk with your friends. Uh, perhaps you can tell us why you got interested in Vrangel? Uh, because it's, uh, I assume, not the most common topic uh, for the Dutch historian to study. So why Vrangel? Why Russia? Why pre-revolutionary time? <laughs> Well, um, I, I explained it just a little bit when I was studying the Civil War. I was looking for a biography of Rangel that didn't exist. And, and what I could read from all the, uh, the memoirs that he was not just a general, but I thought he was, a <clears throat> he was very intelligent, which I think is an exception for generals. I gave this lecture in Holland once, and there was a vice admiral in the, in the audience. 
and everybody had to laugh because they said, well, it's an exception for a general to be uh, uh, intelligent, but he, he didn't mind. Um, and he had a vision of, of, of Russia in case they would beat the Red Army. And he said, it's not necessarily we're going to restore the monarchy. We're going to, to have elections. And if it's a republic, okay, it's a republic. So, and the Nikin wanted to restore the former empire. And also including the Baltic states, Poland, um, uh, part of Romania, Bukovina, which was part of it. And, and Brangel said, and especially the Cossacks were against it. Because the Cossacks wanted to have a sort of form of federation where the, the, the Kuban, the Pirik, um, and the third big... Don. Don? And the Don, of course, but that's the biggest. The three Cossack uh, communities wanted to have a federation, a much, and not to have a strong, uh, a strong band with a uh, strong tie with Moscow. So he had actually he proposed a federation when he was uh, in 1920. So I want to write about that. I said, well, this is an interesting man, so I'm going to, I'm going to write a biography. Antonia, why do you have the same bibliotheque of Dostoevsky? Is there a connection between Wrangel and the family of Baron Wrangel and Fyodor Mikhailovich from Dostoevsky? Ah, well... This is a question which is concerning uh, this historian especially because he wrote a book. There's an uncle of, uh, of Pyotr Nikolaevich, Ferdinand Yegorovich. Alexander Yegorovich. Alexander Yegorovich, yeah, Ferdinand. Alexander Yegorovich, um, Who lived um, as a civil servant in Siberia where he met Dostoevsky. And he wrote a lot of letters home to try to influence, to get a release, an earlier release for Dostoevsky, because he was banned from uh, the two capitals, and he had to spend another, I don't know how many years in Siberia, um, and he wanted to come back, of course. Um, and it's never clearly established, but I think, I think the family of Wrangel, through their connections in Petersburg, managed to get Dostoevsky earlier released. So it's, uh, it's pure coincidence that I'm giving this lecture here in the Dostoevsky Library. <laughs> well, that's, uh, uh, I didn't think about it, but uh, Arkady, uh, well, he, he, of course, he knows it, and, and, and he poses this question. So that's, well. Во время гражданской войны появилась такая песня там "Белая армия, черный барон". Вот почему черный барон это Врангель? Откуда чернота? Откуда чернота? No, 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 no. Well, black has always been the color of um, something bad. That's for a start. The Don Cossacks, a lot of Cossacks, wore black uniforms. Происхождение. А вот что не беру. Да, он потом от Ганнибала. Да, вот, а, конечно. Um, but, <laughs> because he's, well, he's the, he, he was the fifth or the sixth generation from... Um, Ganibal, well, we now you, you all know, of course, Ganibal, the, the the Ethiopian uh, man who came to the court of Peter the uh, First, who married a Russian woman, and the descendants of them, um, well, Russianized all, and you could still see in his um, in his face, especially in the face of his brother Nikolai Nikolai, uh, the eyes which came were rather protruding. Um, but I wonder if they called him the Black Baron because of his uh, relation to Ganibal. I, I, I just don't know. But 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 you had well, there's never been there's never been a for me a good explanation why he was called Chorni Baron. I just don't. Know. Uh, well, and. 
just from a, a personal interest, you said that uh, his daughter was reading your book, and uh, she well she wanted her her son to read uh, this book for her, but um, what was uh, what were her comments? Uh, has she shared? Maybe she had some. Uh, remarks about you've written or some personal um well if this is the term 2006 i had only half of the book ready and she read it and she made just minor remarks as well as far as that is concerned or this house the house where the family stayed in 1918 in the crimea um had a certain name and she gave me the picture of that house and the house doesn't exist anymore because when I was in the Crimea in 2009, no, 08, I went to look for the house and it had been destroyed six months before out of a new apartment. New apartment building was being constructed. Horrible. Um, but then um, she didn't say, she, she, <coughs> she didn't criticize really my manuscript part of it what she had read and um, I, th I think no on, on, the, on the whole well she maintained that he was poisoned she said you are not right he was absolutely poisoned uh, so i'm sorry natasha petrovna but according to me he's not poisoned but she didn't want to hear that because it's much better to hear that your father is poisoned because if he wasn't poisoned then he would have uh, lived much longer he was 49 years old not even 50 years old in 1928 but he had a weak health if you read if you read uh through all the documents and the letters to his wife which i've been reading in the hoover institution in stanford then he's complaining i'm already two two days um i'm, I'm staying i'm staying inside because i can't i can't walk outside i'm feeling very bad and he had um he he, he had been wounded so called by a shell shock and a shell shock is something very serious because your nervous system is wrecked for a time mm. and you can't you can't help it because uh, and a lot of people in the first war in the trenches were also shell shock and it was hardly recognized as being an illness as being a serious wound but if you had a shell shock your whole nervous system was disturbed and you you you, you couldn't function anymore and so now and then that came back with him so his health was not very good um, okay i think we can move on to maklakov yes okay thanks well there's there, there are no slides for maklakov i've uh, uh, i've prepared something and and what i what, what i found was very interesting by um, a rather famous historian, Michael Confino, who was professor in New York State University of Russian history, and he said, there is no reason for historians to pretend that they can understand current events or predict the future based on historical perspective or analogies to the past. Historians should do what they are trained to do which is to reconstruct the past on its own terms because truth exists but not all truths are equal well maklakov was born in 1869 as the son of a famous professor of ophthalmology, um, Alexei Vasilyevich. Uh, no, Vasily Alexeyevich, of course. Um, and his father was um, Alexei Nikolaevich. Vasily Alexeyevich, he was one of the foremost lawyers and, 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 and politicians of the pre revolutionary Russia up till 1917. He was. Um, a, um, a very good lawyer. He was member of the second, the third, and the fourth Duma, and he was the last ambassador of the provisional government uh, from October uh, 1917 till November 1924, when France recognized the Soviet Union 
and he had to abandon <coughs> the building of the Russian embassy in the Rue de Grenelle, which was a huge building, very beautiful building. Um, and then he stayed on as um, the leader of the Russian emigration. Um, but he was not a typical lawyer, nor a typical representative, and even less a typical ambassador, because it was not his formation. He was not in the Foreign Service. Um, and thanks to he, he was very intelligent. Um, what, what he hated were long um, discussions in political meetings. And when that happened, he halfway left the room, uh, often he had a uh, appointment, uh, an appointment with uh, with a woman, because he uh, liked women very much. Um, I've I've been reading uh, I've been reading uh, several letters of women to him, which you can find which in the, in the Adiel Pismen of the uh, Kazodarzhny Historisk Museum in Moscow, and they um, well he's uh, they're all complaining. Uh, about uh, the same thing, which is a lot of women who are deserted by a man complaining about that they love him and he doesn't love them. Well, it's it's uh, it's it's an old story, but uh, you can repeat it every time. Uh, uh, women always will be deceived. Uh, a, a, a lot of men also. Uh, don't 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 mistake me. Um, but so he left often polit political meetings and also often political meetings of the Central Committee of the Cadet Party, of which he was a member from October 1905 onwards. Um, so he was one of the um, well, he was one of the, the most famous um, cadet leaders. And um, apart from many articles by him and on him, um, and a short bi biographical outline by. Was being Aldadov in Paris. There was now again there was no serious biography on Maklakov. Um, so I I decided to to write another biography of of a great Russian statesman, great Russian man, <coughs> and in this case Vasily Alexeyevich Maklakov. Um, and. Um, I must say that I was helped very much uh, in this um, endeavor by Viktor Shavirin, who is sitting here uh, next to us, um, because he has been writing a lot of articles on Maklakov. He is one of the few people in Russia, I won't even talk about foreigners, who can decipher his handwriting, his portrait. I found many letters complaining to Maklakov, saying, Please, Maklakov, Vasily Sage, don't write your letters anymore. Let them type by somebody because I can't read them, my wife can't read them, my children can't read them, my staff can't read them. So we've got to guess half. We've got to guess half of the of the content, and that's not that's that's not that's not one letter. I want three or four. Um, so he, um, I tried to read a letter of Maklakov to Tolstoy. And that was about a uh, um, um, a religious, um, well, uh, uh, a believer who was sent by Tolstoy to Maklakov. They knew each other very well. Um, and Maklakov defended this man and he told about the process. I've come as far as the first two sentences. Um, and then I'm picking up half of the words in, in the rest, but I'm lost. I showed it to a Russian lady in the Hague in Holland, she said, I can't read it. Nobody can. But only Victor Shavirin can read it. And when I met him um, two and a half years ago, three years ago really, um, and we talked about Maklakov, and he said, why don't you write the biography of Maklakov? So I couldn't refuse it. <laughs> Which I'm doing now, but... Um, um, the moment I started reading on him much more than I did already, because I wrote about his discussion of his Milikov in Paris, on the fate of Russian liberalism, the more interesting he becomes. Uh, and as uh, Victor said, he was a Nogo Itajni Chilek. And that, I, I found that a beautiful expression because it's a house with a lot of floors, and, and there you are. You go from one floor to another, 
and every time you discover something different, something new, uh, and, and that's that's really him. That's Makhnakov. He was, um, apart from a good lawyer, he was a very good speaker. He was what they call a Zlata Ust. Well, every Russian knows what a Zlata Ust is. He was a uh, no Krasnoryi, but w- which is which is more. Zlata Ust, somebody explained to me, is really a gift by God. It's not something you can learn. It's a gift by God. It's something more than just uh, just a good speaker. He, he really had that uh, he had that uh, <coughs> gift. Um, well, he is he is he is well. What I said already here on Dabravolsky and Professor Dabravolsky, who worked in 1906, much respected Vasily Sage, uh, asked you not to write in the future your letters yourself, as no I, no any of my sisters, no even members of my family, are the able to decipher your handwriting, and we must guess what is written for one or half the content. Um, now, he was born in Moscow in 1869. He went to the fifth gymnasium. Afterwards, he went to university, where he enlisted in the faculty of, um, of, of science for three years, but he, um, he, he found it was not to his liking, so he shifted to the historical faculty um, where was the famous Professor Vinogradov, already professor, and he finished his degree in four years, uh, and Vinogradov wanted him to stay on and write a uh, doctorate, uh, Dr. Istirichki, no. But, as he had, during his student days, he had many problems with the police and authorities because he had taken part in student meetings, which were partly forbidden, and he was twice expelled from university, but thanks to the influence of his father, the famous ophthalmologist, who had a lot of really influential clients all over Moscow, he was admitted again two times to university. But in his personal file in the Ministerium of Nutri and Jail, uh, that was written that he was um, a man to watch and he knew that he could never pursue an academic career because that was, was his, in his um, um, in his um, in his personal uh, CV at uh, police um, but he had he had not only um, friends um, he had, uh, 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 there, was, uh, there was a man who, um, who wrote that um, I was at the fifth gymnasium at the same time as Maklakov. He was one year younger, but um, his, his moral qualities I don't, uh, I don't um, appreciate at all because he always wanted to draw attention to himself. Uh, and he had only one thing in mind, his own career himself. And so he had detractors as well. He had, he had people who, who, who didn't like him. Um, so that, that's what in, what in an objective uh, biography should also be, be noted, because uh, otherwise it's, uh, it's only, only praise. Um, in 1889, uh, 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 he visited with his father the World Exhibition in Paris, with his 100 years of revolution. And from that time on, he is um, he is enthusiastic about Russian, French um, political life, общественность. I find общественность and общественный it's very difficult to translate in English. I can't find the right word for it because it's it it's somebody who is active in society. But what is that? That means uh, representatives of 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 um, independent. Um, Professions, well, well, medical people, medical specialists, uh, doctors, uh, journalists, lawyers, uh, engineers, whatever you want. Um, and Absessny Jeevil is somebody who is actively involved in society and who wants, in general, to improve it. Um, but he is, he is smitten by, by the French um, public life. When he, uh, when he finished his, um, his um, university degree in history, 
he said, I wanted to, uh, to not to bury myself in books. I want to have a function in society. So he decided to study uh, law. Um, and that was in November 1894. The next explanation was in March 1985. That gave him three months to study a course of four years of law. He he closed. Um, he he he. We, he lived. He lived as a hermit for three months. He worked 18 hours a day, and he he put on a notice on his on his on his on his door with with said Castille prašil boje dvou minut nesidět. Well, so anybody could come, but after two two minutes, they were kicked out. And in three months' time. He passed all the examinations in the law faculty, which normally takes three, four years. Uh, then he became uh, a lawyer with Not um, Plevako, who was then already a very famous lawyer. He could have entered the, the office of Plevako, but he went to Lednitsky, a um, um, Russian Polish lawyer. Um, he defended a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and his oratorical gifts, his Latte Oost, he was so famous that people went to um, to a uh, to a court sitting, to a really uh, a judgment, only to hear Maklakov. Not just the content of the case was not important; they just wanted to hear him because he was so he was so fantastically speaking. And he said, "I tried." to convince the judge or the jury and I'm not speaking to the public. I want to convince them of the lawfulness because he had three principles that zakonis, spravedlivis, is svoboda. Not zakonis is lawfulness, spravedlivis is justice, no, svoboda is freedom. And that were the, um, and, and zashita zakonis, that was for him the most, for him the most important. Um, and, and that you see coming back in all in all the speeches is his, his, his uh, um, heretical speeches. It's coming back that he is um, referring to the law, and he is referring to the law, especially in regard to the government. He said the government must stick to the law. If the government is not sticking to the law, who, what are they expecting of us, simple uh, citizens? So um, he 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 really attacked the government in several uh, in several famous uh, processes and all, and also he defended Bayes in 1913 who was a Jew who was ac accused of killing a Christian child which was absolutely not true and he was one of the defendant lawyers and Bayes got acquitted and. The case of Bayless was world famous. There were journalists from France, England, Germany, United States attending the court just to 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 hear what the case would be because um, well, there was uh, anti-Semitism in Russia and they wanted to know what what was happening. But he 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 got him free, um, and then he um, he became a member of the Cadet Party. Which um, at at the time already he um, he was considered by much of the cadets as belonging to the right wing of the cadet party, because he said we must stick to statehood. Statehood is the most important. If we um, if we um, demolish the state, what will be uh, there will be anarchy, and what will come out of anarchy? Well, who knows? Well. Um, the results are, are, are well known. Um, he had um, uh, let Nikolai Tolstoy had, had had a lot of influence on him. He met him in 1890 when he was in a student organization to uh, to help uh, for the for the famine in the Volga region. And from that time onwards, he um, came very regularly at Jasnia Poljana, where he uh, had long talks with uh, Tolstoy. Uh, and he was really a friend of the family. And his sister, Maria, was a great friend of one of the daughters of Tolstoy. 
but he um, well Tolstoy was was really an anarchist who, who, who didn't recognize the government any government really only his own government in Jasne Payana because he, he was he was he was uh, a patriarch he, he was he had a very paternalistic view of society really so there must be a good Tsar, and Nicholas II, he thought, was a very bad Tsar. Alexander III also. Uh, and he voiced that opinion several times, um, but nobody dared to touch Tolstoy, because when Tolstoy came to Moscow, for example, and it was known, there were 10,000 people at the railway station just to see Tolstoy, who, who wrote, of course, uh, Vaina i Miri Anna Karenina. Um, so the regime didn't dare to touch him. Um, well, as said already, his private life, he liked the uh, women very much. And what is not known, but which was discovered in the Ideal uh, Pismo Historikov, that he had been married um, in 18, uh, 1898, and they divorced after one and a half year, but they got a daughter. She was an actress, and it was considered by his family to be below his station. Um, but anyway, I don't know, not, not, not much, much known of it, but the child died after two years, but he, he, he took uh, much, uh, he supported his ex-wife and the child very good. But after that, he never married again. But his sister Maria um, was his housekeeper from, I think, about... Now, let me guess, 1908, 1910 onwards, but uh, perhaps Victor knows more about that. And, and when he emigrated to Paris, she became his housekeeper at the embassy and later on um, in, in, in the several uh, houses he got in uh, Paris. Um, but um, there's, there's one funny thing I found in, in the Hoover Institution that Kerensky wrote to Maklakov, he said, well, I got your letter, well, it was addressed to me, but the, the content was to somebody else. So you switch the content with the envelopes. I said, Michael, well, that's, that's, that's not so serious. I said, what's much more serious is that in 1910, I had relations with two women at the same time. I wrote both a letter, and I wrote a letter to one in the envelope to the other. So that gave a lot of problems. <laughs> well... Um, but apparently women were smitten with him because he, uh, he, had, uh, he was he, uh, very charismatic, he, he, he was a charming man. And not only because he was a good looking man, but also because he was a very interesting man. And that, that's, that's, I think that won over most of the women. Um, now, there we are in 1917. Um, he should have become Minister of Justice in the provisional government, which didn't happen because Kerensky became Minister of Justice. Um, and then he was passed over several times. He was a member of the Vienna Paramishni Committee and of Commissar Vrimina Committee the Kazudarsne Dume. And that was to prepare the elections for the Constituent Assembly in October 1917. Um, well, in, in May 1910, Izvolsky, the, the Russian ambassador in Paris, resigned because he was not, um, he, 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 he couldn't agree with the new coalition government under the leadership of uh, Kerensky, the social revolutionary. So um, Izvolsky resigned, and in France there was no ambassador. Um, so they asked Maklakov if he wanted to be ambassador in, in, in Paris. He said, oh yeah, why not? Uh, he spoke fluent French. He had a lot of connections in political circles. Um, but Dan Kerensky um, was afraid of his nomination uh, if the Soviet, uh, the, 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 the SRs and the Bolsheviks would oppose this. So it was postponed. But finally, in October 1917, they proposed again, and then he accepted. And as he thought that he had all the time of the world, he made um, he went to Sweden and then to Denmark, 
And then finally, he came in Paris. But on that very day, the, the next day, he presented his credentials at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, at the Cato C. Um, and then they said, well, I'm sorry for you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, but um, uh, your government uh, was toppled over yesterday night. We, we got, we, we, we got a, a, a telegram from uh, a Mr. Trotsky who said that the government doesn't exist anymore, so we can't accept you as an ambassador. And that was a big problem because the whole embassy had no uh, ambassador and he was not officially recognized. He didn't, he didn't figure on the, on the official diplomatic list, but unofficially he was recognized as ambassador of Russia because there was no new government. The Soviet government was not recognized by France, England, United States, Germany, etc. So there was no government. And uh, Maklakov was asked to represent the Russian interest also at the Versailles Peace Treaty, which started after... Uh, well, actually, uh, in November 1918, there was uh, the peace treaty. And then in January 1919, the Versailles Peace Treaty started. And he represented, represented with some other people, the Russian interest. Um, well, uh, that, there's, there's another interesting thing that in, in Moscow in 1917, after the second coalition government fell, he... Um, there was a Moscow conference, and he gave a lecture, a speech, and, and I took out some interesting points. What Russia needs is to be saved, not a revolution. What is there to do? The government goes more on board to the left, which is to us all, the, weak. the country goes more and more to the right. I don't know. And the government will remain without support of the country and will fall as the old regime fell. If Russia stops, at the brink of the abyss. Then yes, Russia is the great Russia, worthy of freedom. If she falls, the people will receive what they deserve. Well, he never thought about, uh, he, 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 I think he, he thought about it when, once they were in Paris, when there was a Soviet regime. And actually then there was the communist regime. Um, well, he was uh, widely welcomed in France by all his political friends and by the French press because he spoke very good French. And he was considered as the uh, uh, um, the Russian Mirabeau. Mirabeau was a French politician uh, just um, in the time of the French Revolution um, because um, he knew, he, he had, Makhlukov had a, had a big and uh, great admiration for Mirabeau. Um, he was a, a Freemason. He was in April 1906. He was admitted Le Grand Orient de France, which is the Mason, <coughs> Freemason order in France. But a lot of influential Russians belonged to the were Freemasons. Kerensky was one of them, and a lot of other ones. Um, there were Kerensky, Nikrasov. Maklakov, Tereshenko, um, Kalpirin, he was a central committee of the central, of the SD, the Social Democratic Party. Um, well, there are really a lot of things which I could tell, but um, one of the most interesting things is um, the big collection of uh, Wrangel. When Wrangel died in 1928, his widow, Olga Mikhailovna, with his secretary, Kavlyevsky, sent all the Wrangel papers, all the documents, to the Hoover Institution at the Stanford University. And the Hoover Institution has a huge collection of Russian documents and books. They have documents which are not in Russia, there has been an exchange with Garth. Um, and Maklakov sent all his papers from 1917 onwards also to the Hoover Institution. And what's in the Hoover Institution also is the 
uh, archive of the Agrana. Agrana was the secret police of Russia. And in Paris was the headquarters of all the foreign Zarubiesnia uh, Delenia Agrana. Um, and they kept the files, they kept copies of all the files of the Agrana of Petersburg and Moscow. They got it all of Petersburg, they got it all in Paris. It was a very rich archive. There were also a lot of archival holdings on French politicians. And when in November 1924, the Soviet ambassador Krasin arrived, the whole building was empty. Everything was removed. All the pictures of the Tsar family, of all the former ambassadors, they, were all re they had been removed by the, the well by, by 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 Russian monarchists and by Russian uh, politicians who lived in Paris and the Orgrana archive was removed by Maklakov and it was sent to the United States by diplomatic pouch by way of the commercial attaché of the American embassy in Paris. There were 24 wooden crates just picked like that. And that was the whole archive of the Agrana. And I found the letters in the Hoover Institution how it was done. Because Maklakov was warned by somebody in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs that the Russian ambassador, the Soviet ambassador, would come. And if, um, well, it was a suggestion that he would simulate a fire um, and then remove at night time all the documents. All the diplomatic documents as well. Um, so they, even in daylight, they loaded uh, trucks full of all the documents out of a, out of a ship in, in part to the United States. Um, and and Maklakov said um, later on to the French press when he was uh, interviewed, so why is the whole building empty? And all the papers. He said, well, we had a, we had a big fire in the, in the cellars and it, well, we could distinguish it, but we had to throw it away, everything. And uh, he was lying, of course, but they didn't want it to fall in the hands of the, the, the Soviet government. Krasin was a member, um, he, wa he was a very famous Bolshevik. Uh, he had been um, ambassador also in England and then he stayed on for just half a year in Paris and then he was replaced with somebody else. But um, let me tell you something about um, about his personality. Uh, Vinavier, Maxim Maizvich Vinavier, was a leading cadet and a friend of Maklakov, and also a very good lead, very good lawyer. And his wife Rose writes about Maklakov. They they had they were fairly well off, and he could buy a house in Paris, a big house where they united a lot of the uh, Russian uh, community. And she tells about um, uh, Maklakov. <coughs> she said, Maklakov as a defendant lawyer spoke fast and simple, prosto, but he captivated the audience and we listened with strained attention. Um, in Paris, he was sometimes at our place, this is the house of the Villaviers. At one time, we had a practice with well-known French people, and we invited Maklakov. He was, from the very beginning, the center of the conversation, as he had been more or less involved in the murder of Rasputin, in December 1916. He described it in such an interesting way, way that the French were absolutely in raptures. She said, Rasturkin. Maklakov was such a man that the better you knew him, the more you liked him, which happened to me as well. All of us discovered in him new, unknown qualities. You could disagree with him on his political opinions, but everything he said was very interesting. Many sided, but most important was that we felt in him a deep sincerity. I remember an evening which we spent in the company of many guests, old and young. Vasily Xej was among them. And as an incomparable storyteller, he captivated everybody, especially the younger ones. He cited Poe's by heart, and at a certain moment, the discussion landed on unhappy love. It was basically a discussion between Maklakov and a famous Byzantine scholar, Vasiliev, both convinced bachelors. Vasiliev 
recommended that the best way to overcome an unhappy love affair was to travel. But Vasily Alexeyevich maintained that any normal man could handle lightly such an affair. Well, can't be surprised if you count the number of love affairs he have had that he could overcome it quite easily. <laughs> um, well, another interesting speech he gave was on the 6th of June, Pushkin's team. In Paris, 1926, when for the first time the whole Russian community in Paris united. They were fighting each other, they had different organizations, different political organizations. Um, but for one day, they united and set aside all their differences. And he gave, um, Maklakov was invited to deliver the keynote speech. Um, and from that day onwards, on the 6th of June, it was a sort of uh, National Russian Day, which they never had had in Russia, because the national days were more or less the days of uh, the birthdays or the coronation days of the Tsars. But this became a national day uh, for the Russians in Paris. I don't know how it is nowadays, the 6th of June. Is this still something special here? It's mostly for Pushkin celebration. Well, yeah, not really Pushkin like, celebration. Yeah, yeah but, but not, not a sort of national. No. no, no. But um, he, he gave the keynote speech and he said that... Um, well, we are here, united. Um, we have been fighting the regime for all we were worth till 1917. There were many shortcomings in the regime, in the Kazudarsta, but still we never realized that we had a Kazudarsta, we had a statehood. And we now that the statehood, because the doctor is destroyed, we just now realize what we miss and what a lot of Russians perhaps will miss. He couldn't speak for the Russians who were in Russia, but he, um, he said it's, it's a pity we never realized it, that we still had a structure, a state structure, which was destroyed. Um, so when um, well, no, this is about the, um, the Grana files. Um, in, in, in February 1945, he went with a delegation to the um, Soviet ambassador, Bogomolov, um, to, to congratulate Soviet Russia, Russia with the victory on, over Germany. But his visit was widely criticized by a lot of Russians in Paris, because much of them had hopes that the Soviet regime would be destroyed. They hated the Germans, well that of course, but at the same time they hoped that the Soviet regime would be destroyed. And for Maklakov, who was really the unofficial leader of the Russian community in Paris to go to the Soviet ambassador and congratulate him. Was, uh, was, was absolutely not done. So he was criticized by a lot of people, but he was also um, supported by a lot of other people who said, well, we've got, to, we've got to set aside all the differences. Soviet Russia is Russia, it's our motherland, and perhaps we can come back one day, um, but let's hope so. Um, and, well, he, he, he wrote his memoirs um, already in Paris. He wrote about um, the first Duma, Pierre Gazudarsky, Duma, Vtaray Gazudarsky, Duma, Izvaz Peminanie, all his, his, um, his lectures and all his uh, loyal, all his, all his judicial lectures were uh, compiled in a very beautiful edition in 49 when he became 80. And it was edited by Aldanov, Mark Aldanov. Um, I've got them at home. I bought it in Paris several years ago. It's a beautiful leather bound, uh, and it's it's um, it's really a joy to read in it because he is what you read in all his speeches that he is coming back to zakonos and spravet leaders, and that state must obey to the law, and if the regime doesn't uh, respect the law, where are we going? Okay.
А, спасибо большое. А, друзья, если у вас, может быть, вопросы? Давайте. Ну вот я понял, что письма Маклакова, они в историческом музее, как они попали туда? Я... Как оказался фонд? Ну, фонд 301, но Виктор Шеверин очень хорошо знает. Но как они попали? Может, там... Уже было в эмиграции. Да, он был уже в эмиграции, но я просто не знаю. Это простой вопрос, но ответ трудно. Понятно. Я просто не знаю. И еще у меня, ну, я вижу материала много и знаю вашу привычку или традицию сначала издавать. То есть на книжку уже явно готова. Но сначала на английском, и когда же мы увидим на русском, но сначала на английском. Надеюсь, что... Потому что это перевод биографии в Рангове, там, там издан уже пять лет назад у Роспена. Но вы знаете, конечно, фильм Роспен, это очень, ну, как это, это большая, большое издательство и очень известное издательство. И, может быть, это, ну, там это есть маленький тираж, тысяча экземпляров, но это уже почти э, стоит... 30 экземпляров. И, может быть, что я могу интересовать э, Распенда Андрея Константиновича Сорокин, там директор Распенда. И я надеюсь, что я могу там, я могу э, его убедить, что опубликовать и там перевод э, биографии, биографии Маклакова, потому что я знаю, что здесь, э, в России, ну, намного больше интерес, чем на Западе. Английский это версия Маклакова. По-английски -по же по По-английски -по когда будет версия? А еще, еще не знаю, потому что мне... По-английски. По а, а, yes. А, I've got to speak in English. If you want to. Oh, that doesn't really matter, I think, now already. <laughs> We can discuss in both Russian and English, so... As you prefer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm still looking for an English um, editor, well, a publishing house, which is not very simple. Um, because uh, they've got to they've got to find um, the audience for it. Who's going to read a biography of Maklakov in the West? In Holland, nobody knows it. In England, he's known among historians. In the United States. He could be in a series of, of, let's say, interesting Russian politicians or whatever. And there are certain um, Indiana State Universities giving such, such a series, is, is publishing such a series. Uh, perhaps the, the Hoover University Press, but they are aiming more at actual political issues. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, easy to, it's not easy to find uh, an editor. Uh, not not an editor. I mean, uh, publishing house. Yeah, but I have to find because. Well, I have. Well, if I may, I have two questions. Uh, one uh, is, why Hoover Institute received all the archives of Russian immigration of uh, the Soviet uh, well, Russian embassy in Paris? Like, why there? Well, the history of the Hoover Institution is the following. Uh, Herbert Hoover, he, who became later President of the United States, 1929 to 1933, as I remember well, he was a mining engineer <coughs> who, who graduated from Stanford University in 1890 or something, 1890 or 91. He, um, he obtained mining um, concessions in... Uh, in Asia, everywhere, in Manchuria, in China, uh, I don't know where, and he made a lot of money. He was a hard-working, uh, a very clever man. And then he became, in 1917, High Commissioner of the United States government in London for refugee problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he um, sent out agents when the war was over, in November 1918, when the war was over, he sent agents to the continent to obtain all sort of documents from 
the, the three fallen empires, the Austrian Empire, the German Empire, and the Russian Empire. And he collected that for the general Golovin, who did most of the work for him. Um, and he just bought all these papers for a lot of people. And then in the 1930s, when with the rise of fascism, fascism, of Hitler, a lot of people were afraid that if the Germans would come to France, and they did come to France, they sent out papers because a younger generation of Russians were not so much interested in, let's say, in, in, in all sorts of personal documents or official documents. And they sent the papers either to the Russian archive in Prague, where was a, a Russian university, or to the Hoover Institution or War and Revolution, as it was called. And Hoover paid for all that. So there was a, a, a big chunk of papers going to, the biggest part went to the Hoover Institution, and a smaller part went to the Prague Russian University. And when the Soviet armies liberated Czechoslovakia, they confiscated uh, these archives as a, between brackets, reward for the liberation of Czechoslovakia. Um, and that was, um, these archives were closed till 1990. And they are now just, they opened 25 years ago. Uh, but that, that's why a lot, of, a lot of people sent their documents just to, because in France I've been looking, there are hardly any documents. Well, at the time in the 1920s or 30s, there lived about 70,000 Russians in France, of which 50,000 in Paris. And there were a lot of interesting people. But in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you find official documents of the relations between France and Russia, France and the Soviet Union, but no personal documents, in no archive, no, nowhere. I thought, in the beginning, I'll go to Paris and I'll find everything. I couldn't find anything. And then when I was reading, I found all the footnotes, Hoover Institution archive. Um, so I, I, I went to Stanford to say to four, four times. I met several Russians there working. Uh, among others, Alec Budnitsky, who wrote, you know, I think, who wrote um, a lot about uh, on, on Maklakov. He published a lot of articles on Maklakov. Um, but, well, nobody decided to write a biography. And the Russians expect me to write a biography in three parts. Rotom. Well, I said, no, uh, thank you very much. I want to <laughs> spend some more time in my life, not only about uh, Maklakov, so I'll try to limit it to uh, 400 pages, just, just like that. that. That's enough. And that's, um, well, I would say normal people. By normal people, I mean uh, no historians. Uh, don't want to say that historians are not normal people, but other people, they want to read it as well. So it must be digestible also for other people. And, and it's difficult to, to find a way to combine a scholarly work and a more, let's say, public style. Thank you very much. And thank you for your interest in Russian history and for making it popular, not only here, but also in the West. With pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Спасибо огромное тем немногим слушателям, которые у нас были. Если что, я думаю, можно сейчас тоже позадавать вопросы, но официальная часть лекции закончена. Спасибо большое. Спасибо огромное, Антонио.